All right, we're going to start with a gift card from Rockland. Rockland, the macaroni grill here for $25. Looks like Brett Godown from the city of Salinas. You win $25 at the macaroni grill. Or Chili's or the little Italy place on the border. Oh. <laughs> Ketchup. Okay. <laughs> the next one is a $25 gift card on Fandango. That's for the movie. Air IT, of course it is Mark, because Mark, I told you you were gonna win today. So now you've gotta do dinner, date, and a movie. <laughs> you can download the app too if you want to do it very quickly. So here's the next winner, it is for a Chipotle $25. And it looks like, of course it's rigged, Andrew Swanson, Palo Alto. Let's go, Andy. Wow, this is like a great thing. Here we go. Here we go, right here. Amazon, $25. Oh, there you go. Oh, I thought you were going to grab it. All right, got to pick one. The next one is Amazon, $25 at Amazon, and a cool little Colette. No, it looks like Meet and Hunt. Looks like Jeff. Jeffrey Leonard. I know he was here. Jeff, Meet and Hunt. Jeff, oh, there he goes. Woo! Come on up. And then you get to pick the last raffle for $25 for the Cheesecake Factory. Come on. And we're going for 100% here of people in attendance. Ooh, it's a Fly Monterey. Neil, did Neil, Neil had to go in, yeah, he, he did. Um, all right, here we go. Bill Harvey, Vantech. <laughs> we, we spoke too soon. All right, we get to pull one more time. Oh, this is. Michael Harrison with Light Guard. No, he had to leave. He had a situation. All right. This one's yours. All right, we're going to just pull pull one, pull one someone that's here. Ada. Andrew who? It can't be him because he just won. Oh, he must have gave your prize to him. <laughs> so sad. I know. That's messed up. All right, here we go. Corey at Kimberly Horn. Kimberly Horn. All right, here we go. We're going to do not you. Uh huh. I know, unfortunately, we had to draw his name again if that was the case. So, oh, no, we're going to go again. Oh, you want to do that? Okay, there you go. Go ahead. <laughs> Bill, okay. All right, before we start the next session, students students that are from here, I believe that you guys need to give your tickets to Scotty Malta. Students, you guys still owe a bunch of tickets to Scotty Malta? Oh, I'm sorry, anybody. There's anybody? Anybody has these types of tickets, they must go to Scotty Malta. Right, Malta, anybody? Scotty's? You got some more, please. Please give him his tickets. I guess there's red tickets, everyone, anyone, all the tickets. Oh, wow. Look at Bob. Bob had tickets. Anybody else got tickets like these? Oh, you do? Oh, can you please make sure to give them all to, to Scotty? All right. Here we go. We're going to start here with Justin.
Okay, guys, we're going to get started here. So good afternoon. My name is Justin Castagna, uh, project manager with Aeropark Trail Institute. Uh, welcome to the student presentation session. Thanks for being here to support these students. They work really hard um, to make sure that they do a good job for you guys. Um, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, DWL Architects and Planners, Republic Parking Systems, and CSHQA. In the past, this session has been successful in opening up doors for these students and uh, connecting them with airport leaders uh, for relationships that they've made here at this conference with you all. Uh, this year, we have a total of 16 students. 14 of those are from Cal State University Los Angeles and two from San Jose State. Seven of those students will be presenting for you today. Uh, I want to openly congratulate all these students, not just the ones presenting, for, for being here and know taking a big step to come up here to the conference uh, also I want to thank dr. Mew who is the Dean of the department and the head of the aviation program at Cal State Los Angeles he's in the back of the room back there congratulations so with that I'm going to introduce all of the students up front and uh, for time's sake uh, I'll introduce them all now then they can get right into their presentation first uh, presenting on UAS we have Robert Stock he's senior at Cal State Los Angeles. He's majoring in aviation administration. And Rob is the president of the Cal State LA chapter. He was very active in administering this trip for the students and he's passionate about getting his foot in the door in the industry. Darnik Mikalian, he was born in Armenia and moved to America with his family at four years old. He's from Sacramento and moved to, to Los Angeles to pursue an aviation career. He went to Mount Sac for aviation science, moved toward ATC and then came back to Cal State University of Los Angeles to expand his education in aviation for a broader career view outside of that. Uh, he is also the event coordinator for the student chapter at Cal State Los Angeles. Second, you'll be hearing from Michael Winan from San Jose State. Uh, Michael picked a very interesting topic that we're all excited to hear about. He's doing the trend of closing general aviation airports and the adversity that those airports have faced. He's a senior at San Jose State. He has his Bachelor's of Science in Aviation with an, an, with an emphasis in management and a minor in business administration. He'll be graduating this year. He's currently working as an administrator at Trade Winds Aviation, a flight school based at Reed Hill View Airport. Next, Next we have Eduardo Galvin presenting on education. Eduardo is a senior at Cal State. He's majoring in aviation administration and is currently working for Birdie and Associates as a business analyst in airport and access control and security as well as information systems. He's very interested in airport development and wants to be part of a team that helps airports bring more safety and efficiency to everyday operations. Presenting with him will be Omar Gonzalez. He's a senior at Cal State, transferred from Cypress Community College. He's majoring in aviation administration and currently working with American Airlines in Terminal 4 at LAX. He's interested in pr pursuing a career as a pilot and or airport management, and this is his first conference, and he serves as a secretary for the Cal State LA chapter. Lastly, we have Pearl Sun. She's a s in her second quarter at Cal State Los Angeles and a transfer from Mount Sac. She's majoring in aviation administration with a minor in management. Pearl already possesses an associate's degree in aviation science, commercial flight, and business from Mount Sac. She worked as an intern at the FAA in Washington, D.C. during the summer of 2015. This is Pearl's first conference, and she works at LAX in customer service for Virgin America. Alex Shear is a junior at Cal State Los Angeles, a transfer, also a transfer from Mount Sac. He has a, is going for his Bachelor's of Science in Aviation Administration and will be graduating in May 2017. He currently has about 100 student flight hours as well as an associate's degree in commercial flight and does community service work watching aircraft at Brackett Field. He's preparing himself for an entry-level aviation position. So with that, I'm going to step down and let these students get started. And uh, good luck to all you guys. Uh, 
somebody wants to pass it to me. Yeah. Uh, to get started, uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank Rocky for, for the opportunity of sharing the Expo Bowl for the uh, UD Health Club Festival. Um, we are uh, presenting here today at UAS uh, Annual Nurse Health System. My name is Carmel. I'm Robert. And to get started, um, we're going to define exactly what UAS is, and I'm pretty sure all you guys know. Um, UAS is basically any aircraft unmanned um, that can be remotely controlled and by via ground control system. And that could be a drone as we're passing around, our RC helicopter or any model aircraft. And these are all being put into this category and uh, require uh, new legislation being passed um, as we speak. The type of UAS that we have are commercial, military, and private. And for commercial, it's basically the ones that are used in film in industry or doing aerial photography. And as for military, are the ones that are doing reconnaissance uh, uh, runs and bombing runs out in the Middle East. And as private, it's the other hobbyists, the ones that just want to fly around for fun. Right here, uh, you get to see all the different types of UAS systems, um, from military use to public use to commercial use. And again, they don't limit themselves to drones as far as for wind skimming. Um, they can be just as, just, just as normal as a main helicopter or aircraft you see flying around. Um, what is going around this in the building is a DJI Phantom 2, um, which you see uh, right corner of your screen. That's how small or big, if you want to call it, um, compared to others in the industry. Um, and drones, uh, they're not a new phenomenon. Uh, they've been around 20, 30 plus years. Uh, military dates back to over in the 50s as far as use. And recently they've been gaining popularity due to recent technology advancements on precision flight and uh, user-friendly remote um, and then the government wants to implement drones and UAS systems into the air, air traffic system and aviation system. Um, and these are two main goals um, in a safe and proportionate manner. Also, um, providing proper innovative and creative industry for UAS, um, creating, uh, as of 2013, uh, over 50,000 new jobs in UAS systems, whether it's engineering, build, design, or retail sales. Um, as far as do's and do nots, uh, owning a drone, um, we're gonna start off with the do. Uh, keep your drone in, in sight at all times, so make sure you see where you're flying and where the drone is flying towards. Um, choose an unobstructed area far away from any buildings, um, crowded areas, uh, hazardous um, check your drone with each time you fly. Um, I'm a small RC operation at UAB, so pretty much all the drones I use and secure um, before flight to fly off. And as I'm securing them, I'm also securing the air aircraft to decide to fall off, fly off into on the runway or the fog. Um, read the manufacturer's manual. Make sure the limits. Uh, you know what the limits of your drone are, what the capacity is, how far it can go, how high it can go, and you don't push those limits further than that, and you're causing danger in public or um, buildings. And then uh, remember, you're always responsible in avoiding collisions. And the uh, do not, basically don't fly over people or over private property or any vehicles. Don't fly near buildings or crowds. Don't fly any... Uh, any near man aircraft because you don't want to cause a collision. That would be really bad. And you don't want to be flying within a five mile radius of the airport. And also don't fly over uh, above 400 feet, which might be kind of hard to tell if you're at 400 feet or not. Penalties, um, fines and penalties. Um, and these will change because legislation is new and um, as, as more and more come out and more people start using them. Uh, these are just some new ones that the FAA has put out. Um, so register drones flying in an unsafe manner around the airport or over a crowd or in the stadium. Um, you can get up to a $1,000 fine, um, and that 
call it professional law enforcement. Um, as of now, recently, there haven't been that many cases of information being declined. Um, what they do is they tell me to grab my phone and go back home. Um, not the best uh, scenario, but uh, it's a new system and you have to be used to it. Uh, potential jail time, uh, six months up to three years. Again, uh, all at the discretion of the state or the whatever the case is, the judge or the police officer handling the situation. Um, the main laws of passed is an unregistered drone, and this isn't to discourage people from buying drones. This is just to get people that already own drones or the UAS system of model aircraft to register. And um, you can go up to a $27,500 fine for an unregistered drone. And uh, again, not to discourage anyone if you want to buy one to go out and buy one and be safe while doing it. Uh, criminal cases, and this would be if you're flying a drone fatality or in an aircraft crash and due to, again, severity, the judge or people handling the case loss from uh, public endangerment and uh, fatality or good uh, civilian damages. And for what to do, uh, if it's your first time using a drone and you don't know what to do, uh, just go straight to the internet and go to uh, AFA website that they developed knowbeforeyourfly.org. After that, you get the list of all everything in PDF form. The do's and don'ts are there, and any uh, common actually asked questions. Then the next step is actually register your drone because it's only five dollars, and I believe it works on multiple drones for that registration. So, five dollars, thousand dollar fine compared to twenty five thousand. And uh, next thing is actually contact the air traffic control tower. If there's no air traffic tower, contact the airport uh, regarding the about flying your drone to see whether you need permission, prop, uh, file paperwork, or anything. And uh, after that, you have to contact the FAA. You can kind of use it for the public or for organizations to operate the uh, UAS in a particular area. And if, if uh, FAA agrees, they will give you a COA, which is a certificate of authorization. And for those that uh, like to build or themselves, uh, you still have to go through like an airworthiness certification for it. So you can't uh, make any mistakes. Uh, what to do at airports, which many of you have been asking recently. We had uh, Todd McNamee present the other day and one of the questions came up as airports, what can we do to prevent the either endangering the airport itself or the flying public from going to the airport. Um, one thing is, uh, as you saw, they come here with websites, they promote drone safety on their website. And one of the websites mentioned by Rob, the knowbeforeyoufly.org, is uh, mapping uh, which allows users to see where they're allowed to fly and if there's an airport nearby, what restrictions, any military restrictions, any, um, I'm not sure how accurate the CFRs are or how up to date they can be with the knowledge there, but there's a bunch of restrictions and you can click on an airport restriction area and they'll give you the phone number of the airport or the air traffic control tower that you can call in and get authorization or uh, maybe not authorized, but they can give you guidance on where to go and where to fly and how high to fly. Um, Facebook, if the airport has any Facebook or any other social media, RSS feeds, but you know, educate the public, educate and get the word out there. Not many people visit the FAA website to learn about drones or the safety of how to use those drones. So that's another thing is promote, 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 educate the public in the area. Um, there's other con uh, contractors and conventions. Um, drone conventions have been gaining popularity, as has been, has been gaining popularity. And uh, also stores, retail hobby stores, RC stores, visit, um, take a pamphlet or anything, knowledge uh, about drones, where to use them, how to use them, how to contact you personally, uh, how to contact the airport and where to get the COAs if they need to. Um, and it goes on from there. Also, uh, 
I wanted to see things in our first time we go to City Hall and make noise. Um, the issues about when they started getting calling in, telling me you guys are making too much noise, now it's about your turn to make some noise and get some uh, get some stuff ready. Let the City Hall Council members know what's going on and how to keep public safe. You don't want to go uh, drone flying into a hel uh, airplane and then causing it to crash land over a house or something like that. And so just giving educating uh, City Hall members, homeowner association, and lobbying groups. Another thing that the FAA did that's really, really neat is no drone zone. Um, I think that's the image you see up there. And they provide PDFs, um, JPEGs, and other forms that you guys can print out, post around the uh, airport. Uh, they'll hand out to these retail stores, let them know. There's a brochure for do's and don'ts. There's a brochure on that PDF that you could download, print out, and go to and give it to the retail stores or hobby stores nearby. Some potential safety measures that are currently either being implemented or should be implemented are uh, limiters or governors to prevent it from actually exceeding the elevation that it can actually fly. And this geofencing that's being done now um, with the Maccabees in Victoria County were telling me that they tested it out and the drone didn't go through their whole property with geofencing. And another thing is actually like maybe incorporating a safety class or video uh, requirement that you have to take or like watch a video. And then after that, you would be given a certificate to purchase, just like the person shooting the firearm is. You have to take the test and know the rules and everything. And then uh, another thing is uh, instead of stopping retail stores, maybe set a restriction like a weight limit. Don't uh, sell any drones that's more than two and a half. And another thing is uh, radio jammers. Uh, this is here a video of what uh, is being done in Tokyo, Japan. And uh, I think we get it running. Um, and they, police law enforcement have created a drone themselves and the netting and stronger. I think it's like one over four blades and faster. And then it goes out and captures drones Anybody in operations want to fly a drone? Just catch an air drone? Uh, the reason why uh, Japan did that was because uh, somebody flew a drone carrying radioactive material over the uh, uh, pri uh, a prime minister's office so in Tokyo. This next video so here. So now Japan, I believe, has 16 of, of those drones in place at different government facilities. And then our friends in Europe, this is what the Dutch is doing. Uh, we just saw this this morning, so we added it. They're actually yeah. using an eagle. They're, they're, they're experimenting. They're, they're actually creating three eagles to <laughs> attack the drone. <laughs> and uh, that's the radio jammer. That's the radio jammer. So <laughs> that big eagle. That's our mascot. <laughs> so, and then the other side for actually potential aviation industry, uh, what I see is that we could actually use it for like actual aerial photography instead of actually using actual airplanes because that you got to pay the pilot, pay for the aircraft fuel. So, with the photography, it allows you to draw out the layout of the land, but the drones aren't just also doing photography, they could also do uh, 3D mapping of the terrain, and uh, they'll give you a highly detailed render scale that satellites can't get. And another thing that the drones could be attached to are to in infrared cameras, and they could actually uh, help protect wildlife uh, when doing uh, surveillance uh, per perimeter checks. And then other uses is uh, for search and rescue could actually be used because uh, if actually I believe the LAX Arc for them to actually fly around, it's about six thousand dollars in fuel cost. So, help cut the cost down. This, uh, <coughs> this last video we have is uh, scientists using the drones they particularly made themselves, and it's uh, Madison Mountain 
and it's a three-D scaling of the mountain using a drone going um, not by remote control, by a flight path that they've drawn out and implementing a quick anti-air drone. These actually have an antenna on the top of the tail. It looks like just a regular airplane, but it has a propeller in the back. And um, flying around the mountain, it gets over 300 million pinpoints to accurately um, get measurements of the mountain and create a 3D m model. And uh, this can be used to scale mountain or building area around your airports as well. It's about 90% accurate with the detailed scale drawing. That's the flight path right there. So imagine that flying around your airport, you can see a quick scan of your whole 360 layout. Thank you very much. So for time's sake, we're going to do all questions if there are any at the end. Good afternoon. Just to echo what Karnik said before his presentation, I want to also add my gratitude and our gratitude as a group of students for every opportunity that Hawaii provides us to implement its development. So thank you very much again for that. And so Omar and I thought that this con conference would be a great place to share what we looked into regarding how the aviation industry gets involved in education to make a difference for youth. So in early 2015, this bipartisan organization called Big Focus released a study on federal funding for K-12 education. And what they found was between 2011 and 2015, Congress had cut K-12 education by about 20%. And year over year, if we adjust for inflation, almost each one of those years saw a decrease. And to be a little bit fair, this chart doesn't include funding included under the American Reinvestment Act. And so where does this leave us? We have the classic cases of not enough teachers, far too many students in one classroom, not enough extracurriculars during the year, not enough summer programs. And it's really just an overall missed opportunity for educators to connect with their students and focus on them in a way that promotes strong development. Luckily for them, there's a lot of help. A lot of organizations, private and public, are helping students where they might not have too much help from their schools or their local government. And so the first organization that I want to talk about is EAA through their Young Eagles Camp. And the Young Eagles Camp happens twice a year. It's in the summer. They have two summer programs. It's for middle school students. And it's in a science camp format where they learn things that are more engi engineering related. Um, so they do things like building powered models, um, learning about wing ribs, they build their own aircraft wings. And this summer program is actually named one of the top 10 summer camps with the money. And it is a lot of money. Because they not only do they get to learn in the classroom setting, they students also get to tour Pioneer Airport, the Air Venture Museum, and they get to go flying. And another program is the Southwest Airlines Adopt a Pilot Program. It started in 1997 and since then has reached over half a million students. And at 800 volunteer pilots, it's one of their larger community outreach programs. So it's a four month, month program that happens in 1,500 classrooms across the United States. And Southwest provides all materials, so they, at the beginning of the program, on their own, created lesson, lesson plans, activities, handouts, things that pilots could use so that when they get to the classroom, the entire lesson is ready. But I did say that there are about 800 volunteers and 1,500 classrooms. So clearly, a lot of these pilots are doing at least two or three classrooms. And that's really what makes this program very special, is all of the passion that goes into it. 
because it makes students so much more excited when the pilot is very excited to be in the show. And because pilots inspire the respect out of a lot of us, especially students, especially young children, it makes it really easy for them to instill the flight value, the stuff that they're once created. And flight value stands for fearlessness, leadership, integrity, gratitude, honesty, and tenacity. And this is something that teachers should really appreciate because they want to teach their students to be good, strong people. And it makes it a lot easier when they have a pilot helping them along the way because these students are a lot more receptive and they're a lot more excited to be learning things from their mentor. And a lot of teachers have found through surveys done at the end of the year that the adopt a pilot program is the number one time of the year for these students. A lot of parents even go in the classroom. They don't find out, find out about the program sometimes from the teachers, they find out from their kids who come home and share how excited they were at school. They talk about how they can't wait for next week to see their pilot come in. And a lot of these pilots go above and beyond. Uh, I spoke to one ambassador who told me that she and her friends who are participating in the program have probably spent hundreds of hours looking up their own lesson plans, creating their own games, because while Southwest did do an excellent job of creating material for them, they are an airline. They are not educators. So a lot of these pilots have gone out of their way to look for even more material to supplement what Southwest is already giving them. APA PATH stage is, PATH stands for Pilot Initiative Handbook. Where something like PATH pilots play a crucial role. They play the number one uh, drug uh, offered online. And the pilots go um, get into the drug online starting late. They have courses for students to learn the history, the acronym, alpha, bravo, charlie, and learn airport markets. And they have it for when they go to school. Pilot visit, um, visit the school nearby, and they have the PowerPoint ready. They could just go inside, say the mm, say what they like about aviation, inspire young kids, and that's pretty much what it's supposed to be. All right. So the materials include the teacher modules. The teacher also gives the modules to the students, and PATH gives them a pack. They show you from the beginning history, all its um, careers, about pilots, flight attendants, project management, security, TSA, everything that's involved with the airport that students might not know. And it's all free. Everything is free. So PowerPoint, modules handouts, books, it's really good. All right, so my next one is San Ice Airport, uh, career day. It started by, uh, with, with Barbara Caesar in 2006 with Think Aviation, with Councilman Tony Partisan. Uh, this program, uh, Barbara believed uh, in 2006 that uh, a pilot shortage, so she wanted to make a program for students so they could learn about aviation as well. Um, sadly enough, uh, Barbara passed away a year later, 2007, uh, but the program's still going on. So San Ice, Synchro, and the Councilman. So the program's still going on. It's every spring. It did it on April. Uh, it also allows the airport to open up for all, all the students in it. It's about 13,000 students from different high schools. Anyone could go, anyone could attend. All right, thank you. Most of my high school students, sorry about that. All right, so there's a their presentation demonstration. Uh, I, um, I was talking to one of the presenters from San Ice. Told me uh, there's 30 minutes for the students to go in. They'll go, they'll just 
go get a tour around the airport. They'll talk to a pilot. They'll talk to management. They'll fix the facilities. And they'll have like four shifts every every month. So. And I'm talking about uh, this is where I actually started from. Uh, tomorrow's an auto museum. Uh, I'm going to read what they had in the, uh, <coughs> on their page. So some of CM with interactive exhibits on aviation plus educational programs start targeting inner city students. All right, so it's programs out of Compton, Air, uh, Compton Airport. So most of these people, don't, they don't really know nothing about aviation. They just see the airplanes going up. That's all they see. It's a lot of noise in there, but no one, it's not about airport noise in there. It's just about information for, for kids. Uh, I'm going to help us for this program as well. Um, we take the kids. Uh, it's always every Friday. So they come after school. We'll help them out with their homework. We'll teach them about free flights. We'll teach them around the airport. Uh, we'll have Van Wagner next uh, next door as well. Uh, next to Tomorrow's Nautica Museum. That's a banner towing company. So they also figured out the, uh, the airline pilots. So banner towing, different kind of pilots out there. Try, trying to get their mind out of out of their city. So we also go to the high school. Go to Compton High, Dominguez High, Centennial, all those all those schools right there around that area. We're trying to get everyone inside. So I mean, I, I always tell them, I'm, I was from Compton. I came out of that program. I mean, I'm back in Compton. So just to introduce myself again, my name is Michael, um, San Jose State University. Uh, so before I get started, I'll give you a little background as to why I'm giving, or why I did this research. So this is uh, what I did as part of my individual studies for the aviation honors program over at San Jose State. And the reason I chose this topic is because uh, it was less about, you know, just taking information and regurgitating it and more about, uh, a little more about analyzing why things happen and sort of learning about how multidimensional aviation can be uh, and multidisciplinary the problems can be. And another thing I'll say before I start, since almost everybody's asked me this, uh, no, I'm not going to talk about Santa Monica Airport. So these are just some of the uh, raw numbers on public use airports closing uh, between the years 1999 and 2013. Uh, the reason why I chose this time period as is at the time of doing the research for this uh, paper, uh, 2013 was the last year that uh, was available as far as this category of statistics goes. Uh, so the numbers are 169 airports across 15 years, uh, which is just over 11 airports a year. Uh, now, I did the math for you ahead of time, and that's only a little under 5% of all of the airports over the last 15 years. So, you know, a lot of people would say, okay, well, that's only 5%. What's the big deal? Well, it's a big deal to me, uh, mostly because, as uh, Mr. Angelus said during the keynote speech, uh, there's a lot of uh, intangibles uh, about the future that come with an airport. So uh, there's the pilot shortage that everybody talks about coming up uh, in the future. And a lot of people get their private pilot license, which we know is sort of the first step towards becoming an airline pilot at these public use airports, uh, small general aviation airports. Uh, another uh, thing that he also talked about was that there's people like me who sort of get their first aviation jobs at these small public use airports, as well as some of the students sitting here. And a lot of the students hope to be getting uh, so that way they can start getting their experience. So if you, you know, consider that, um, and in a lot of uh, these airports that do close, uh, there are no close alternatives to those airports. And uh, anybody who might have been otherwise interested in getting into aviation uh, may consider something else because they don't see a path for themselves. Uh, so I, I kind of divided everything into three closing categories. Uh, these are based upon ACRP Report 44, um, which really goes into detail about this topic. So if you know if you really want the nitty gritty details, I would definitely read that. Um, it'll take you quite a while to get through and it's probably more information that uh, anybody would really have time to present on. Uh, 
Um, so the first is economic factors. So these, uh, in most cases, people uh, or airports, um, for whatever reason, and we'll go into some of those, uh, don't have the funding to operate them anymore. Um, the second category, I kind of lump two together, social and environmental factors. Uh, the reason why these are two, uh, these two are grouped together is because I kind of consider them uh, as externalities of the airport. So it might not have to do with the actual operations at the airport itself or the finances, but pressures from either environmental agencies or from the surrounding community, uh, et cetera. And then the last, I don't know why the numbers all say one, uh, but the last category I'll talk about is our infrastructure problems, which can be either the type of traffic the airport can handle or the condition of the airport itself. So economic factors. So um, I won't go too into the finances behind an airport. Most of you know this. Most of you are managing airports already. So I'm talking more uh, specifically about specific airport cases. So the first airport is Angola Airport uh, in New York. So Angola Airport was a privately owned airport, uh, general aviation, public use, uh, where the owner uh, decided that he couldn't own the airport anymore. Um, he wasn't, he was, I mean, he would expect to take a loss uh, forever on it because it wasn't making any money and there was tons of shipping costs to operate an airport, of course. Um, unfortunately for that airport and the people who use it, there was no replacement. Nobody wanted to buy an airport, uh, especially because they knew that they would just be spending money to run it all the time. The second case uh, is Blue Ash Airport in, in Ohio. Uh, so Blue Ash Airport was originally owned by the city of Cincinnati. Um, the city of Cincinnati wanted to focus on their larger airport, so they uh, decided that they wanted to sell that airport, which the city of Blue Ash decided to purchase. Um, turned out that they there was a necessary runway reconfiguration that they needed to do, um, and they just weren't going to be able to pay for that themselves. Uh, they were denied FAA funding for this. Um, I know it says slashed. I actually changed that in a second version, but that version wasn't working, so this is an original version of the um, presentation. So uh, similar to the first case, um, the airport didn't have anybody who wanted to own the airport anymore because operate the airport, um, and the airport was subsequently closed. Um, so one situation I'll talk about where a, an airport was faced with a financial difficulty but was actually able to pull out of it is Ocean Ridge Airport here in California. Um, I'll get into why they were uh, faced with that problem a little bit later when we get into the infrastructure problem, uh, but the short story is, is that they uh, needed to repair their runway and they weren't going to have the funding to do that. So what they did is they crowdfunded their repairs. So if you're not familiar with crowdfunding, um, you might have heard of Kickstarter. Um, they didn't do it through Kickstarter, but the central setup is, is they ask for donations, um, and for certain donation amounts, you can get certain rewards uh, upon completion of the project. So in this case, they offered things like tie-down spaces, uh, parking stickers for their parking facilities, and other things like that of varying amounts and quantities depending on how much you donated. So uh, one big thing I want to highlight, though, is that uh, there was obviously some form of mismanagement here at the airport uh, in terms of ignoring the runway maintenance. Now, it's, it's great that they were able to come up with a unique solution, which is crowdfunding, in order to take care of that. But they also need to realize that that's not going to work a second time. If you solicit donations to repair your runway once, and then in five years you're saying, hey, let's donate again to uh, take care of the airport, people are gonna be a lot less inclined to do that a second time because they're gonna say, well, why would I do that when in five years you're just gonna have to do it again? And this is just sort of an example of the before and after at that airport. So the left side, I mean, you can see it's in terrible condition. Uh, the markings are barely there, a huge pothole in it. And then the right side shows uh, just what it looked like upon resurfacing and I'll talk a little bit about the social and environmental factors. Uh, really mostly just the social. So we all know about aircraft noise. I'm not gonna drone on and on about it. Um, airplanes are always gonna make noise, especially when we have these piston prop driven aircraft. They're gonna be loud and people are gonna be upset about it. But there are certain things you can do to take, to sort of mitigate that problem for the community. Um, a lot of airports, like we saw yesterday, uh, they have these fly neighborly programs where you avoid buzzing houses, avoid uh, turning over 
in certain areas. I know at Hayward Airport, uh, they have specified departure paths to try to avoid that, try to turn away from local communities. So even steps as small as saying, you know, suggesting to your local pilots that, hey, you know, instead of turning out over this neighborhood, why don't you turn out over this lake? Um, you can relieve a lot of the community pressure. Uh, another big thing is residential development. So uh, as in the case of some or uh, airports, such as my home airport, we told you, uh, when these airports were established, they were in empty fields with nothing around them. Now, over the last 50 years or so, uh, the community has really grown around it, and it's mostly a residential community, uh, actually low-income housing. And uh, it's a really congested area. There's also a couple of schools, including a high school. There, uh, there's an elementary school. There's a Raging Waters right across the street from it. And there's also a shopping mall on the arrival path, where actually airplanes commonly have to come less than 50 feet above that shopping mall in order to land there. So um, a lot of a lot of things I've heard from the people that use the airport, they go, well, the airport was there first, so you know, for, forget the people around there. But the reality is, is that you can't do that. And the reality is, is that maybe only a couple of hundred people actually use that airport, where there's a few thousand people who live around the airport. So those people, in the long run, are going to have a much larger bearing on what happens to the fate of that airport. So you need to, you know, respect the surrounding community as much as you expect them to respect you. Uh, otherwise, they will get you shut down. Um, so that comes into another prevention case, which is uh, Albert Witted Airport in Florida. Uh, so they were faced with, uh, uh, an I call it an initiative. Uh, some people decided that it would be a lot better to have a waterfront park instead of the airport. Um, so the proponents of the airport, you know, they had to come to these community hearings. They had to make a case for themselves. Um, Fortunately for them, uh, the city vote uh, voted to keep the airport by a margin of 80 to 20, so it wasn't even close. Um, but there was one thing in reading the article about this whole ordeal that sort of uh, was bothersome. So one, one person was quoted saying that you can't compromise on an airport. And that's a really toxic attitude to have because if you have this attitude that you can't make compromises, then eventually uh, people will decide that they want a waterfront park instead they can outvote you because the reality is, you know, only so many people use an airport. So there's always going to be more people in the community than there are of the people who actually get direct benefits from the airport. And there's going to be less people that see the value of the airport um, than people who do see the value of it. And this was a really important airport for that city because it turned out that they, the airport itself makes about a $60 million economic impact to that city. Um, so that's a really important thing to consider. So, um, so show of hands, who manages a small, what we consider a small GA airport? Okay. Now, how many of you actually have community involvement programs or events where you try to invite the local community to come out and see what you're a part of? Good. So here's just an example of my home airport. Like I said, there's Reed Hillview Airport, uh, completely surrounded by the community. There's houses on all sides of it. Uh, Directly to the east, there's the water park. Uh, directly to the south is the shopping mall. And there's the high school to the uh, west of it. And then out of view to the north is the elementary school. So as you can imagine, and like I said, these are this is a low-income area with, uh, to be honest, poorly built houses. And I've lived in that neighborhood. And you do hear airplanes all day long. And it does vibrate your house. As an aviation person, it doesn't bother me. It, but I can see easily how it bothers residents of that neighborhood. And so we'll also, uh, for the final category, we'll get into the infrastructure. So you saw, like I said, Ocean Ridge Airport. They had a huge problem with their runways. Um, definitely not safe. And I spoke with Gary from Caltrans about it yesterday. Um, it was just in terrible condition. And that's not something uh, that even the airport managers decided was a safety issue. It took a Caltrans inspection to find the runway in that condition and for them to say, OK, uh, that's not all right, and now you have this long to take care of it. Um, and then there's the case of pre-jet era airports, such as uh, Robert Mueller Municipal Airport in Texas. Um, it was built before the big jumbo jet era, so the airport was not really designed to take the traffic and the large uh, jets that we have today. 
And as a result, they ended up deciding to close the airport uh, in favor of a new airport. So I know it seems like empty advice, but the real prevention strategy here is to avoid mismanagement. Um, paying attention to what's going on at your airport, um, making sure that you have an idea of what condition your planes are in. And so the future climate of general aviation. So it's not like general aviation is in danger itself. Uh, there's always a need for general aviation. People are going to need to learn to fly. People are going to open businesses at these airports. But it's important to keep supporting general aviation because if it becomes hard for people to get into it, um, you get less diversity in the industry uh, in terms of uh, brain power and whatnot. Um, so that can be a real problem for the future of the industry. Um, there's a pattern of mismanagement that needs to be avoided, like I just said. Um, there's no simple solution for this, but it's important to invite the communities, uh, invite comments from the people who use the airport, the pilots, the you know FBOs, the uh, even the people who just live around the airport. Um, even showing that you know about the problems and that you care about the problems uh, can be enough to some people. Um, you can't wait until the community is upset about something because once they are, um, it's going to be very hard to fight it. Thank you. Last group. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Pearl Sun, and we only have one mic, so that's Alex. And we are Cal State Allied students that are studying um, aviation administration at, with our topic on airport security. Before we get started, I would like to thank our moderators, Justin, Sean, so for giving us the opportunity and for organizing this event for us and letting us um, present our plans. Now, I would like to start off saying that aviation is considered the most safest transportation in the world. However, that might not be the same for airport security. So, Alex. How's it going, guys? My name is Alex Shear, and uh, I get the fine privilege of talking about terrorism in a room full of uh, aviation executives. So this will be fun. Um, so to start this off, let's look at the definition of terrorism. Uh, it's the use of violence and intimidation uh, in the pursuit of political aims. I think that's really important that political aim is the core of what terrorism, uh, terrorists in general are trying to achieve. And this makes sense because if we look at the rise of Fidel Castro in Cuba, he's kind of the grandfather of terrorism. He's the one that kind of started and promoted this um, type of airline hijacking in the 50s um, to try to get his point across uh, to the Americans and um, as well as promoting his political agenda. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, you can see a peak of terrorism. And over here, we have a list of airlines that have all been tragic in, the, in that statistic. And one that, that I find particularly interesting is the, uh, in 1969, we have a 14-year-old uh, American uh, by the name of David Booth, who uh, on record is the youngest hijacker uh, in history, 14 years old. And so I just, I don't know, I find that, find that pretty interesting. So to look at, let's look at some ter uh, terrorism strategy, right? Terrorism back then uh, was low stakes, smaller planes. Now we're dealing with bigger planes, higher stakes situations. So there's more radical methods that uh, terrorists are used now because we're in the modern age. Um, we have mental health. There was a huge crisis. Uh, as we saw last year, um, terrorism was a really big deal. Mental health plays a huge factor. Uh, on top of that, influx of media access for potential criminals to fine tune their strategies. A lot of people wonder, how do these t uh, terrorists communicate? And ironically enough, they communicate through Xbox Live, PlayStation 4, um, the online, online video games. Because how do you take someone seriously um, in an online video game? And so that's a lot of the communication goes through um, these avenues of uh, talking. So, great example is 9-11, the San Bernardino terrorist attack. The patterns that we can gain or uh, collect from these examples is that they're simultaneous attacks. We saw that in 9-11. Um, they're very coordinated attacks, and they happen in multiple areas. 
And so with this in mind, Pearl's going to explain to us how the CSA has responded um, to this general strategy. So again, I'll be talking about airport security before and after TSA, TSA ever since 9-11 and how technology has evolutionized and advanced throughout from the past in the 1970s to the present time, so 19 2013 to the present. So this picture is structured in the 1970s where basically uh, no ID was required to check in. The check-in agents in the back, um, they basically look for any suspicious uh, behaviors from the travelers or the passengers. And if they do suspect that there are some suspicious behaviors and characteristics, they go to step two and number three, which security personnel are there to oversee the passengers and the travelers, which they are also contacted by the airlines, but not at the government at this time. This is structured in the 2000s where 9-11 has not, has not hit, but passengers and travelers are accompanied by uh, families and friends and they could basically go up and walk up to the gate. Also at this time, passengers can go through metal detectors, um, check baggages are sometimes, sometimes inspected and checked thoroughly, depends, depending on um, the, the staff and also um, carry-on bags also go through x-ray scanning. Last but not least, 9-11 has hit and this is in the 2013s and present times where as you can see, there's, a de there's definitely a lot going on. Um, right now, TSA oversees and runs through security operations throughout all U.S. airports as well as domestically. And we also see that on step number two, passengers and travelers have to take off their shoes. And you will see a reason why on the next slide. And that's pretty much it. Number four, that's where we are. And I'll be going over a history of airport security. July 17, 1970 is the first use of metal detectors where New Orleans International Airport was the first to implement the first metal detectors as well as um, passenger, passenger profiling in order to promote their airline safety. Next we have November 1972, screening of carry-on bags required. Basically this happened because hijackers from the Southern Airways Flight 49 was uh, they wanted to go, they threatened people to go into the nuclear reactor. However, FAA responded by this by saying that, oh, we need screenings of carry-on bags, so why not? Finally, 9-11. November 2001, TSA was created. In December 2001, TSA began to inspect shoes, mainly because there was a passenger who say, whose name was, first name was Richard, and um, there was some ignite explosives on his shoes, and as a result, that's why we have to remove our shoes. So there is a story behind that. August 2006, because of that, TSA mandates to remove all shoes at the airport. December 2009, TSA calls for information of full body scanners, and we will, I will talk more about that on the next couple slides. December 2010, they finally began their advanced imaging technology to replace old metal detectors. Technology evolution, this is the basically the um, metal detectors, I guess you can say New Orleans International Airport. This is what it looked like. After that, 9-11 happened, and this is the first set of the machines. It's called RapiScan Secure. It's they use backscatter technology, which mainly focuses on electromag on, ra on radiation, and it produces 2D or 3D images that creates a realistic image. However, because of the machine um, of creating this, it was phased out in 2013, and TSA terminated their contract. Also, mainly because manufacturers were not able to um, come out with the, the software to deploy non-imaging automated target recognition softening with time, which is the ability in which the device can implement or see through objects and targets based on the data sensors, based on the data obtained from the sensors. And also, the, um, the picture, the image is kind of controversial because it tells the passengers and the travelers saying that, oh, it, it's uh, it violates the Fourth Amendment rights of all humans, which is unreasonable search and seizures. So because of that, we have now the new technology. This is called the Pro Vision Scanner, which is uses the milli millimeter wave technology, which means basically focuses on electromagnetic radiation. As you can see, the image is more cartoon version-like, which is like more of a generic picture. So 
it's much better. And it also has an API software, and it opts out all full body scanning. All right, so here's what we're looking at, guys. I was, I was going to ask the, the crowd a question or two. What do you guys think? If you're a terrorist, what do you guys think is the hardest thing uh, to go if you're going to go to the airport and say, you know, your objective? And my answer would have been, uh, it's an arsenal. How are you going to be able to get weapons on board if you can't get through what Pearl just went through uh, teaching us about TSA? And so here's a clip of a, uh, what do you call it, a constructed shotgun, if you will, that is made entirely off resources you can find at an airport gift shop and manufactured in a, a restroom. So this is an interesting video that we found that um, we will take a look at in just a bit. So you can see with an axe can, Red Bull, some batteries, you can make a pretty deadly explosive. So to look at uh, inside the mind of a terrorist, this is, this is the terrorist's answer to what Pearl just mentioned about the TSA. Here we have a surge burr, which is similar to a crossbow. Um, they use galaxy grabber, a rib from an umbrella, dental floss, a tumbler straws, and I mean, this is, some, this is enough to cause a lot of damage to either a pilot or somebody that's trying to stop you from your mission. Um, over here we have a fragatina, literally just a chemical weapon inside that you would normally think is just a coffee pot. Um, over here we have a blow dart. And uh, lastly is a bat made out of, um, what you see here is the constitution with uh, just uh, what you see is a series of magazines rolled up and then tied together with dental floss with a ornament of some kind that's sharp enough that where you can club somebody and do significant amount of damage. And so what we have to keep in mind here, guys, is that weapons made available after, to, uh, after passing TSA, that is something that uh, new age terrorists are thinking about to get behind enemy lines in a sense, right? And so the problem is we need to get a standardized safety um, across the board, across all nations. Right now, we're similar to Japan, Australia, Europe, Canada, Singapore, and Israel. Uh, but we still have to figure out a way to contact uh, China and Russian um, aviation administrations to make sure they're on board with the same security features. I don't know if you guys remember, a while back ago, uh, there was a Russian aircraft that went down due to a soda can explosion. And this is something that we saw uh, similar to the other slide. So just something to think about, something that, um, you know, Safety is, is always going to be challenged nonstop, and uh, we just have to keep ratcheting up different standards to meet the uh, demands of the moment. All right, and the solutions. We, have a, we found an article in 2015 saying TSA has failed 67 out of 70 tests by the Department of Homeland Security of the Red Team which as a result, 95% failure rate is pretty high. So we, we s decided that some solutions for this are simulations, enough practice for uh, t TSA to keep continually looking for those weapons inside those baggage and whatnot. And we believe that TSA and airports should have more open communication in order to, uh, in order to fill in the gaps of the regulations and the policies because there are many loopholes and it's not yet perfect. And even though there are TSA controversies between the public, the airports, and the federal government, we have to appreciate that weapons are actually found by the TSA, and they do post this on their social media websites, such as Instagram and Twitter. And we have to appreciate that when we get screened by TSA, we actually feel secured and protected. Like, when we go on board, we do not want to sit next to someone who has not been through or passed through t TSA. We actually want everyone to go through that so that we feel secured and protected. And not, not last but not least, one of the uh, Cal State alumni from 2000, who is currently a transportation security administration and the aviation inspector, says that even though uh, we have all these controversies at the TSA, 
there happens that no domestic terrorist radiation attack has, atta has happened in the United States in the United States ever since 9/11. Um, thank you very much for our presentation, and I hope you enjoyed it. So great job, students. That was very, very good work for all you guys. Let's just give them all one more round of applause. So um, lastly, uh, we have some plaques to present for you guys. Um, Rob, as the president, um, I'm going to give you a plaque for Cal State LA. So here you go. And um, Michael from San Jose, I also have one for you. Lastly, what I want to do is at the end, everybody who did come to the lunch that's still here, uh, come up front and we're going to take a big group picture for all these students. Um, and I wa just want to give one last thank you to all you guys for sitting here and being here listening to these students. You know, this is a very, very useful uh, tool for them to get their foot in the door in the industry. And uh, we couldn't be happier, Sean and I, to facilitate this for them. So uh, thank you again. And uh, oh, and also, yes, thank you. Any questions, please, for them. So if there are any questions, uh, I think they are ready to answer them. Anyone? Thank you for your comments. Uh, well, just uh, during throughout the whole uh, conference uh, during the UAS, I noticed that some people were complaining about how the uh, airport and the police don't get along with each other when it comes to uh, drone fighting. They could actually, the police could actually do something to tell them uh, to do a reckless uh, engagement, and they could actually stop it and and take the drone and, and give them a fine to tell them to do reckless engagement and just spare. Thank you. Okay, so that wraps up the student session. Thanks again, and uh, Gladys, or Gail, if you want to come up. Seems like I turn off the little screen in the corner. There we go. So that everybody knows, um, so for the conference wrap up, we'll provide kind of a, a report overall at the during the conference um, banquet, president's banquet. Um, first of all, we want to say special thanks again to the those who are in the room, all of the conference committee. Can you stand once again? Stand up for me that are here. Good job. Thank you very much. Especially the program, um, I want everyone to know there was a collaboration on the programs, and I bet you those are the same people who are going to stand up again on the program committee. Go ahead and stand again. You all stand again. Very good. 
Thank you very much. And then Brett, stay standing for me real quick because Brett took the lead too this year along with Jessica. We really appreciate what you do. So let's give him a special. <laughs> and then tonight we'll recognize our exhibitor and sponsors again. Um, just to tell everybody, it's been a wonderful experience for me. I know that um, I always work through stuff with a smile, but it actually was a, a pleasure to be the conference chairman for our president over here, Richard, President Smith. So very quickly, everybody, so you can get going and those who have to stay for the picture, um, the cocktail reception, 6 p.m. upstairs on the upper plaza. If it's raining, which I don't know if it is going to be, um, then we probably will be moving it inside. But right now, except for being out there, typically they have heaters. The President's Awards or President's Banquet starts at 7 p.m. Right in that room, the Dolphins Ballroom. And then there is a post-banquet gathering at 10 p.m. in the Monterey Bay Room, which is right next to the um, desk or check-in. Um, there is a general sh uh, membership meeting on Wednesday morning. Um, so tonight, you guys get to relax and uh, get ready just to enjoy um, dinner together. So with that said, President Smith, come on up. And then that way he can really close this out. Oh, okay. There you go. Thanks for sticking around, he said. All right. Pitchers over here. Thank you, everybody. See you tonight. <laughs>